All right. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Pieski, and with me I have Dominique Martin. Um, we are beyond the PhD, um, so some housekeeping to get out of the way first. Um, as you heard, the session is being recorded. Um, it will eventually be posted on our YouTube channel and everyone attending today will be able to access the video if you want to go back and look at uh, what we talked about today. Um, our chat is being uh, moderated by a few of our team members. Please, when you uh, use the chat, don't uh, send it directly to the speaker, myself or Dominique. Uh, use the everybody tab. Um, we ask you that you remain uh, muted. Uh, you can turn your video on for this if, if you want. You don't have to. Uh, all questions should be answered throughout. We'll have a couple pausing places just to make sure that everyone's questions are getting answered. Um, and then there should be plenty of time at the end if you have questions. Um, so with that, so why don't we get started? So this is our CV resume workshop uh, that we're offering as part of our summer workshop series. Okay, so I'll just start with a general overview of what we're going to cover today. So first, we're going to start with CV and resume general info and resources, um, and also cover what is a CV, how to structure one, what's a resume, and how to format that, and the differences between the two. Um, we're also going to talk about when and where to use a CV or resume when applying to jobs. So these documents, which is more helpful for maybe like an academic position or industry position, formatting and building both a CV and resume, and also how to convert your academic CV into a resume. So what is a, a, a CV and a resume? Resumes and CVs are both very subjective. Your job or institution may have different requirements or expectations. Uh, no two CVs are equal and depending on what you're applying to, it'll di dictate how you format that document. And the goal of our workshop today is just to provide some helpful tips and tricks uh, that could be used across any job that you'll apply to. Uh, but again, you'll want to look at specific resources on how to format that for the particular job that you are going to apply to. And we'll also give you some explanations and examples on when and where to use each type of document. Um, and there's a lot of additional resources available to you online. Uh, we're out of the University of Connecticut, so we have the Center for Career Development, but I'm sure that the universities that you're at also have career resources. Um, you can also check out Science Careers through AAAS, as well as Nature Careers. You can also get a lot of information just by uh, asking to do an informational interview. And, again, please remain uh, muted for that. Um, you can also ask to do informational interviews uh, with, with people in positions that are of interest to you. So what is a curriculum vitae? So a CV, it's Latin for journey of your life. And it's a really detailed documenting listing all of your experience. It covers things including your education, your training, any teaching that you've done, presentations, both poster and oral presentations, grant funding, service that you've done, as well as your publications. There's no page limit. Most CVs are usually between three and six pages as you're in your field longer. That, of course, increases. But the nice thing about a CV, there is no limit. And it grows as you gain experience and as you move up your academic ladder. You want to make sure that even though you're at the beginning of your career, you're not putting in things that you did in elementary school or middle school. That stuff isn't going to matter for your, for your current career. Um, so don't be afraid that your CV might only be a page or two page. It will grow, we, we promise. So what goes in a CV? Um, so I myself am an academic, and so these are the sections that you'll see in a CV. You, of course, always start with your contact information, your name, your address, your email, LinkedIn profile, and you start with your education. Good practice is always going to start newest to oldest. So if you have a PhD, you list your PhD first, then your master's, and then your bachelor's. Um, any postgraduate education and training, like postdocs or internships, uh, academic appointments that you've held, whether that's an adjunct position, a scientist position, 
and then generally your other employment section that may not be within your field. Um, any societies that you're part of, honors and awards, service that you've held, whether that's in a department or you volunteered for a society um, or like a professional organization. You can list out any of your local and national service, uh, your teaching, mentoring, grant support, your publications and presentations. Now, the way that we've listed this on here is not the order that you use for your CV. When we think about academia, you can think about the different institutions that you'll end up. And you can think of an R01 institution, something like Yale, UConn, Harvard. That they're gonna care more about your publications, grant support and mentor. You will be teaching most likely at these institutions, but that is not their top priority. Versus if you're an academic looking at a PUI institution or a primarily undergraduate institution, then they're gonna care more about your academic appointments and your teaching and mentoring over your publications and grant support. So that's why it's really important to look at others who are at similar institutions or similar jobs that you want to go to. So that way you can format your CV properly. So what is a resume? Um, a resume I like to think of as an executive summary of your experiences. So it's a succinct and clear summary of your experience in education. Um, it promotes specific or special skills and competencies. So it'll be a lot more tailored than a CV. It's often more tailored for the job um, or role you're applying for. And one of the things about a resume is it's a much shorter document than a CV. So typically one to two pages, although one is preferred. If you have maybe 30 years of industry experience or have been working in a field for a really long time, it's no problem to get onto two pages. But I think for most people kind of in the early stages of their career, one pages is recommended. So it's kind of that shorter document. It's going to be a little more tailored. You'll have some overlap with your CV sections. Of course, you'll want your contact information, your education, um, your jobs and experiences. But you maybe might take out some of those sections, such as um, mentoring or the presentations you've gave um, to fit it onto that one page. So as I mentioned, there are some standard resume sections and this has some overlap with your CV. So as always, you'll want your contact information on there, your name, your email, phone number, um, you can have your location. Um, you can have an objective or summary statement. So this will be at the top um, and can be for the role, just a brief description about you. Uh, your education, of course, your employment history, any relevant experience for that role. So you don't wanna talk about everything you've ever done, but if you have maybe an internship or a specific skill you have um, that's relevant for this job, you can have it. And also you can have a skill section or skill summary. Some people format this as a chart or a table or just have them listed. But if there's specific skills that you know are gonna be valuable to the role, you can definitely include those in your resume. So as I mentioned, it should really be an executive summary. You don't need to have everything you've ever done, um, really kind of picking out and highlighting those important experiences to uh, fit that job. So comparing your CV and resume, again, what shared your info, your education, your employment, and your experience. However, as we said, the CV, there is no page limit. It literally is a document showing your entire journey through your life, your ex teaching experience, mentoring, grants, funding, publications, presentations, service, memberships, honors, and awards. And your resume is going to be much shorter. As we say, it's an executive summary. One page, if you have to do two, put it onto the second page, but no more than that. And it's going to be tailored for each role. So I've seen a lot of people use the same resume for the like different jobs. And it's not good. You want to make sure that you've put in the effort and rearrange the sections as necessary and only show what's relevant, right, for the job that you're going to be applying to. As we said, there's an, op an optional summary statement, and we'll show you some examples of that. And we'll go through how to craft each of these sections in a few minutes. 
So it's important when using a CV or resume to really know your audience and know the job you're applying to. So when you're thinking about your audience, are you applying to an academic job or an industry job? And even within, I guess, quote unquote, industry, there are a variety of different roles. So it might be a more technical role, like a staff scientist position. Uh, maybe it's a more uh, non-research based, but still STEM position, such as a medical science liaison, medical writing, um, even within like program management. There's a lot of different kind of sectors and things you can go into with your PhD. So it's really important to know where you're applying. Um, you also wanna think about what do they value? What are they looking for? So what skills, um, even Rob talked about at different institutions, some might value teaching more, some might value publications and funding. And same thing with industry positions. Are they looking for more soft skills? Are they looking for technical profici proficiency? Um, and then another thing to think about is what other materials are you providing? So often um, you might be providing a cover letter uh, for when applying to a job. So maybe if you're adding a cover letter, you might not need that summary statement in your resume. Um, often with academic positions, you'll be providing a lot of other materials. Are you getting letters of recommendation? So just some things to consider when applying to a job and knowing which document to use. So next, I'm just gonna talk about briefly kind of what um, of these different areas are looking for. Um, and I'll, so you have your academic institutions um, or academia, industry, and when I'm talking about that, kind of more of those technical or scientist positions. And then also those non-research STEM positions that I kind of mentioned before. So something like a medical science liaison, something in medical affairs, uh, maybe in program management or project management. So in academia, some of the things they're really looking for is impactful science. So are you an expert in your field? Do you know kind of ins and outs of uh, your science? The ability to demonstrate independence. So can you get funding? Are you able um, to kind of stand alone as a researcher? Fundability is also a big thing, potential for collaboration, either with others at the institution or with other institutions. Are you a good colleague? And also service and involvement. So this can be service at your university or outside, maybe in um, different sectors. So in industry, they're really looking for technical proficiency and relevant research. So it might not be exactly what you're researching during your PhD or postdoc, but kind of that you have those core base of skills um, and scientific abilities. And the ability to see the big picture. So you might not always be working on just one project. You might be bouncing between different projects. Kind of that ability to see how the science fits into the greater goals of the company. The ability to, project, uh, to have project management. So that's something we kind of all do anyway without thinking about it. Um, within a uh, PhD or postdoc, because you're always in charge of your research, but something that's really important to industry. Also, are you an effective communicator? So you develop these skills as you grow. So things like oral presentations, poster presentations, science writing, that you can be a team player and a leader. So you'll often be working within teams, working with different levels of management and how you can handle that. And also might be helpful to have some business acumen. So obviously industry positions, they're looking for things that can help the company grow, help the company, company be profitable. And in those non-research STEM positions, it might be a slightly different set of skills they're looking for. So they still want that strong science background and ability to understand the science. And it's still good to have those technical skills. But there's also maybe a bigger focus on communication, your ability to communicate the science with both uh, written and oral skills, and um, a lot of relevant transferable skills. So some I talked about, maybe like project management, leadership, communication, adaptability, but you might be doing also more like program management or administrative stuff. So a little more flexibility in those non-research STEM positions. So let's talk about academia. And what we mean by measures of success is what, what do these different sectors view as things that will help you uh, do well in your, your field. And we're using this stool analogy. It has three legs. So each of these that we go through will have three arms or three legs. In academia, it's going to be a focus on teaching and mentorship, research, and service. Your teaching and mentorship, if you're a graduate student, you may have had an opportunity to 
lead graduate level classes or maybe you had an experience to be able to be a teaching experience at your college or a local college. All of that counts. Now, your formal course is taught, you wanna make sure that when you list those, that's a course number that's actually associated with your name at a college. Oftentimes, if you're TAing ta a lab course, it's not your course, right? You're gonna be working under somebody. So you wanna make sure that you're able to delineate that properly as you're talking about this, but it still counts. Any guest lectures that you've given, if you've been invited to talk at your old institution or new institutions, a really important one is being able to develop curriculum, um, things that you've done your training in and what you can offer to the college, what makes you unique, as well as your training mentorship. You're gonna be training whether it's high schoolers, undergraduates, graduate students, or even postdocs in your lab. As for research, that's pretty self-explanatory. We're talking about your publication history, your history of funding, and your dissemination of research. And the other really key part of academia is your service. You're gonna be involved in so many different types of committees, um, including like your advising committee, but maybe promotion and tenure, appointmentship and retention, curriculum development committees, diversity, inclusion, um, inclusion and uh, equality, um, student services, uh, different search committees. You're gonna wanna make sure that you're involved at any, if you have opportunities to be involved in service now, I encourage you to do that. That could even be, include like being part of your graduate student uh, association or postdoc association. It's encouraged, it shows that you, you wanna be involved for the greater good. Um, so that could be at the institutional level or at the external level, whether you're invited to review papers, uh, be part of organized meetings for maybe your professional society like the Society of Neuroscience or Pain Society um, or local science committees like, uh, for, I'm biased, the Connecticut JSHS. Uh, so you're involved in the community. So with industry, there might be a slightly different focus, kind of as I mentioned earlier. So those three pillars are really your transferable skills, your ability to collaborate, and also your technical skills. So we'll be talking about transferable skills a lot. And I think it's something really important when transitioning potentially out of academia into industry that um, you're aware of and, you're, and you can develop uh, during your time during your PhD or postdoc. So these are things such as communication, flexibility, critical thinking, attention to detail, project management, time management, organization. Um, and this is not an inclusive list. There are uh, many transferable skills. If you just Google it, a whole bunch pop up. Um, but these are kind of some of the core ones that you can really develop during your time during your PhD. Um, also collaboration. So you will also um, usually be working within a team, interacting with different areas of management. Um, and there's probably a different leadership hierarchy than you're used to in academia, um, and ability to move between different groups and projects. So I think as academics, we get really focused on our little niche area of research, um, but in an industry position, you might be jumping between groups, you might be jumping between projects, and the ability to kind of take your skills and apply them to different areas is really important. And also leadership, there's um, lots of different ways to grow and develop in industry positions as well. You can move more into management roles, you can move between groups, um, still take on more responsibility as you grow. And as I mentioned before, there's also those technical skills. So think of for like a staff scientist position, you want mastery of certain lab techniques, uh, potential um, things that can be really um, important and stand on a resume is different programming languages. Do you know R? Do you know uh, maybe MATLAB or something else? In vivo and in vitro experience. So have you worked with animals um, during your time or cell culture? It's really important to kind of highlight those skills and experiences, and also the ability to learn new skills. Are you adaptable, are you flexible? Can you uh, take on new projects? Um, and one thing I would say is very important is when you're maybe reading a job description for an industry position, look at exactly what skills they're looking for, what things they want, and you can potentially uh, tailor your resume to include those things. So if they specifically ask for in vitro cell culture experience, write that down if you have it, or maybe, particularly I'm in immunology, so if they're asking for flow cytometry, you can write that down um, and really kind of match your resume to what they're asking. 
And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about non-research STEM positions. So there definitely is some overlap with those industry positions. And I say that's mainly um, kind of in those transferable skills that I talked about before. And um, so again, the flexibility, critical thinking, attention to detail, time management, organization. Communication is a really big part of these positions. So as I mentioned, oral written communication, you can demonstrate that you've done that through um, either poster presentations, talks you've given, papers you've written, all the different ways you disseminate your research and talk about science. Um, community engagement. So are you involved in different leadership activities, different outreach or involvement, any teaching or mentorship? They really want to know that you can talk about science to broader audiences, that you're not just talking with your close colleagues, that you can really uh, disseminate that research and that science. And in these non-research STEM positions, you might have more kind of administrative roles. So this might be something um, as like uh, going to a conference or developing a different program, project management. Leadership might look a little different. You might be leading teams in different ways. That business acumen is still important because you will still most likely be in a company that wants to be profitable. Participation in boards or committees, maybe more involvement in uh, different uh, kind of developmental things within the organization. Any questions before we continue? I don't know. I think this is a good pausing point. Yeah. Um, and as I said, you can put them in the chat. You can also save your questions for the end. We'll try to save some time so that if anything comes up, but anything uh, burning comes to mind right now, feel free to ask. We don't have anything in the we don't have anything in the chat yet, but I will let you know if we do. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, everyone. All right. All right, so now we're gonna talk about crafting a basic resume. So this is just kind of a blank example just to highlight some of the fields and basic format you could use. Um, so what's really important is presenting all the important information about you in a professional, concise, and clear way. So you wanna make it easy for whoever is looking over your resume to just kind of skim it, pick out the important information. Um, oftentimes the person first looking at your resume is either going to be a computer or someone in HR, um, not often the exact person hiring you. So maybe it's just a computer matching keywords or someone skimming through it, but you want to make all the information accessible. Same with your CV, as Rob mentioned, um, it's helpful to order in chronological from newest to oldest. And as we've kind of talked about, know your audience in the position you're applying to. So you can tailor it for that role, maybe match keywords in the job description. You wanna make your resume easy to read and, fo and follow. So use a legible font, um, use maybe underline and bold sparingly, kind of use a consistent formatting to make it easy to follow. You wanna use action words within your resume. So instead of just being like, I did this or I learned this, you can um, use some action words and we'll have a table to show you some more later, but things like uh, maybe conducted, developed, evaluated, mentored, some things to just make them pop. And then you also wanna quantify your achievements and use metrics when you can. So you have a lot less space in your resume. So it might be harder. You might not be listing every single publication you did, but you can say that during um, essentially your graduate studies, I. Uh, first author two publications and co-first authored uh, four more, you can uh, quantify um, things just to really put a number to what you've done. So let's talk about how you craft your resume. And so the first thing, this is, it's, it is an optional section, but if your job is not requiring you to give you a cover letter, a good way to give a little bit about yourself is to give that objective or a summary statement. And it's, it's basically a brief statement at the top of your resume. If you're in the middle of changing careers or if you've had many years of experience, it's an opportunity for you to write one or two sentences to highlight your accomplishments and your skills and to show the employer at a glance why you are the person for this job. So as an example, so this one comes from our uh, co-director, Brittany Knight. I'm a self-driven, independent, and enthusiastic scientist within the pain research community. I'm seeking the USASP 
program coordinator position because I'm enthusiastic about this new organization and the opportunities it supports for the fostering of pain science and the advancement of basic and clinical research. Says the purpose of why she's applying uh, to this job and why she thinks she's a good fit for the job. And you can also include your strengths and areas of growth. These are things that you might find in a cover letter, uh, strengths, persevering, diplomatic, and thorough, areas of growth, balancing multiple projects in a timely fashion and willing to learn quick things. This shows that this individual did their homework to figure out what new things they might encounter in that job, right? So it, depending on the position, you should be aware, like you may not know everything needed to be 100% independent in that job, but it shows that you did your homework and that you have the ability to fit, find out what we're gonna need to do. So I think that's a really good place to put it, you know, in your objective and summary statement. So now I want to talk about really crafting those experience sections within um, your resume. So this is often maybe a job, internship, uh, some type of experience. Um, and this is just a really basic kind of format, but some keys to always have. So you always want to have the job or position title. You want to have the dates work there. Um, if you're still working there, you can just write um, until uh, you can write currently or present. Um, you want to list uh, essentially the lab department or the company and also the location. Um, and then to kind of format that experience, it's not great to have like big paragraphs of text um, that can get hard to read, hard to pick out the key elements. So using bullet points is very helpful. You um, often want to start with a general project overview or significance. Uh, um, this is just the general snapshot. And then you can talk about your key results and accomplishments. This is where you can talk, use some of those metrics I mentioned. And we'll have another slide uh, in a little more depth about that later. You can also talk about your relevant skills that were developed through this work. Um, so especially in maybe a lab setting, you can talk about those technical skills. You can also try to incorporate some of those soft or transferable skills. Um, and then I would suggest you keeping it to a couple bullet points. You don't want it taking up almost half the page, but uh, three to five-ish is usually sufficient. So what are some of these skills that we're talking about? So we can break them up into soft skills or your transferable skills which I think as a scientist, this is the one that we're worst about thinking about. We always think of our technical skills first, um, but just by being a science trainee, you're well-versed and written in oral communication, your ability to collaborate time management. Whether you think about it or not, you are a project manager. You're the one guiding your project from start to finish. Uh, your ability to be part of a team, leadership, motivation, your ability to be a mentor um, and your analytical and critical thinking. Everybody has them. Make sure you, you list those skills that are going to be important for that job. Again, you're limited on space. Don't list out everything, right? Your technical skills, list your relevant assays, any procedures that you know, specific lab te techniques, uh, in vitro and in vivo work, um, specific software, um, we should no longer be putting on our resumes that we know how to use Microsoft Word. I really hope we do, right? And that along with Microsoft Excel. But if you know a programming language, that's perfectly fine to put it. Uh, but we should stop putting that we know how to use Microsoft Word or PowerPoint um, it, for our, our, our resume. Um, you can include other data analysis programs as well as uh, other higher computer skills. You can either leave it as a list, or if the space provides, you can make it into a chart or a table. You can get creative with it. Again, whatever is best suited to fill that one page space that you're limited to. Uh, Dom mentioned action verbs earlier. Again, you want to avoid statements like, I did, or I helped, or I, you know, just it, it sounds boring. And so we have different classes here, improve something, let a project, create something, manage a team and research. So you wanna try using a variety of language to kind of spice up your resume, right? HR, I mean, people who work in HR read a lot of resumes. Use words that are going to show that you are a better communicator, right? There's better ways to say, I did something. 
No, you formulated or you founded, um, you planned or operated. So try using these. We'll have um, at the end of this, you guys will all get an email about like, uh, like takeaway messages and we will include this chart for you to use. We encourage you to use some of these words. So an example of this, so I saw this online and I thought it was fitting to show for our seminar today. How would you write, I changed a light bulb on the resume? You single-handedly managed the successful upgrade and deployment of new environmental illumination system with zero cost overruns and zero safety incidents. Perfect, right? You, you can take your experience that you've done and squeeze everything out of it that you can, right? Grad students do more than just bench science, right? To really highlight what you can do by using some of those actions. Another important thing that we pointed out was using metrics. Again, resumes, you're limited on space, right? So instead of listing out every single conference that you went to, you can say something like presented poster and oral presentations at seven local and national conferences with two poster awards and one travel award. Or something like researched XYZ resulting in two first author publications, one review article and four co-authored contributions. Again, this is for your resume. CV, you list the whole thing out. You can use blocks of text in your CV. Resume, take advantage of using numbers, right? It, it will really help you and it will save space, especially if you have a lot to talk about. So um, you also, when you're crafting a resume, want to make it visually appealing. So this is actually my resume and I'd say my pretty basic, but some of the things I really strive for are having effective use of white space. So using all your space, you can um, connect the formatting, you can use your margins a little more. Um, and as I talked about, you want to make sure the formatting is consistent and legible. Um, you can make sure that you use a font that's easy to read um, and that a text size that is legible. So even though you're limited to one space, you don't want to make everything like eight point font because that might just get hard to read. So really that effective use of space. You want to use headings, subheadings, and labels to organize your sections. So with mine, I usually um, bold, capitalize, and underline the big section. So like education, employment, and research experience, involvement, skills, and proficiencies. Um, but then within that, um, it's more just normal text. And I would suggest using bold and underlined sparingly. It's really helpful to make section headings or titles stand out, um, but you don't want that everywhere, or then it's gonna take up space. It's gonna make it hard to read, hard to follow. Um, as I mentioned earlier, chronological order, I kind of like to think of it as, um, so like top to bottom and then left to right is how people read. So I usually try to follow that format. And then, as I mentioned, use bullet points to break up chunks of text. You don't want big paragraphs kind of in the middle of your page. And the bullet points will help people kind of really pick out those different proficiencies, different skills, um, and kind of guide the eye going down your resume. So how are you going to tell your resume for your job application, right? You may want to add your LinkedIn profile, a blog, a website, or a Twitter handle to your contact section, um, ways to, for you know, your hiring manager to find out about you and more importantly, the department that you might be applying to. Again, your objective or your summary statement is gonna be optional. Um, if there's gonna be a cover letter, um, add outside interests if appropriate. You know, they kind of wanna know who you are, right? Who they're applying. Are you gonna fit the culture of the company? Um, as you're making your resume or your CV, you're going to want to consult the job posting and do your homework. Look at similar job postings for similar companies, right? Maybe the website that, you know, maybe the company that you're applying to doesn't have a great website. Look beyond that one. If you're looking for a staff scientist position, I'm sure staff scientist positions are all pretty similar. Do your homework, learn what they're looking for. As you're writing your resume, make sure you're using the keywords that you see in the job posting. If they use the word in vitro technique, I hope that the word in vitro technique shows up in your CV or your resume or your cover letter. Versus if they say cell culture, 
use the word cell culture, right? We know that in vitro and cell culture are meaning similar things, but you're gonna want a word match. A lot of times, again, it's an HR person running through. They're not a scientist. They don't know what these things are, or it's a computer program reading the document for you. By word matching, there's a higher chance that your resume is gonna end up on the desk of the person who's actually gonna be hiring you. Include as many of the preferred skills as possible. Again, you might not 100% match everything they're looking for. These job postings are a perfect role. They want somebody who's young, but also has 15 years experience for an entry level job. You're not gonna have all of that information, right? you're not gonna meet that. So apply to the job anyway. It gives you experience and as you move up and you may get an interview, it's just additional practice. And then make your resume keyword rich, as I said, and appropriate for that sector, whether it's academia, industry, or a non-research STEM position. So this is a kind of fun activity. So I've talked about those industry, more technical positions, and also the non-research STEM positions. Um, and so we've talked about that kind of keywords and uh, keyword matching uh, between the posting and uh, your resume. So this is um, essentially, we took a bunch of different job postings and their requirements um, for similar roles. So these are all scientist roles. You can see uh, like uh, senior scientists, scientists, staff sci scientists, all with kind of within that immunology field. And using a word cloud generator, plugged those um, requirements in from that job posting. And these are the words that popped out as most often uh, showing up. So things like immunology, in vivo, T cell, design, immunotherapy, uh, projects. And you can look through and kind of see it's a lot more technical. Um, it's a lot of kind of immunology focused um, words and things, but you can essentially pick out those different topics, those different words and plug them into your resume. Um, and now if you wanna go to the next one, Rob. Um, so this is a totally different role, still an industry position, but this is more you think about your um, non-research STEM positions. So these are all, medical science liaison positions within immunology. Um, so still immunology field, but different role. And you can just look, same thing using word cloud generator um, with these different roles, how kind of different what they're looking for is. So things that pop out are scientific support, speaker training, um, industry registries, scientific conferences, information, leadership, um, it's a very kind of different focus. So even though these are both immunology positions, although one's more technical, one's uh, not as technical, you can really see just that different in verbiage and language between the two roles. And you can do this too. So if you're looking for a specific job or uh, in a specific field, you can take a bunch of similar postings, plug them into a word cloud generator and see what pops out. And that might help you kind of pull out um, some words to use in your resume. So now your biggest question that you're asking. Most of us probably have a CV. It's an exercise that most grad students do, or if you did some sort of like an undergraduate research experience, most of us have an academic CV, but most of us are not gonna end up in an academic position. So how do you turn that really long CV into a resume? Again, the goal is to keep your resume one to two pages, it should just be an executive summary, not your entire life's journey. You'll use metrics within your text to quantify your accomplishments and proficiencies and use action words. The use of action words isn't as present in CVs because you use kind of blocks of text like I taught X, Y, like I taught these courses, I published this and you give the citation, right? You're not going to do that on your resume. Uh, you want to be consistent and you want to use intuitive formatting. Again, don't, it's sometimes it's better to not be as creative with the formatting of your resume. Don't look, make it look totally unique because somebody who's reading that for the first time is going to get annoyed that they can't find the information easily. Cut out unnecessary sections and you want to, again, tailor that resume to the role that you're applying for. And so we have a couple examples to look at today. 
Um, so let me close out of this and do this here. Dom, you, you can see this, correct? Yep. Looks Perfect. Great. I get so nervous. I mean, I teach courses for a living and I still ask all my students all the time, can you see my screen? So what we're looking at now, this is our director, Britt Knight. Uh, what we're looking at is her CV. We see that it's several pages long. But what you can see on each of these is very consistent uh, formatting the use of these, these gray boxes up top to kind of break up our sections. Contact information is always up top. Uh, address, phone, best, you know, reach out, your email. Education is typically always first. Um, and, you know, postdoc, PhD, post-baccalaureate, then your, your bachelor's of science. Again, new to oldest. And so Britt, I know, you know, I know Britt, she's in a, a non-STEM research position. Uh, so she's part of the U.S. Pain Society. So something that's really important is being part of other groups, right? So she shows that she's been part of these uh, affiliated here. She shows that she's able to effectively communicate, right? Having manuscripts shows that you're a good written communicator, followed by presentations and conferences, leadership, mentoring and teaching, community outreach. Again, so the job that Britt applied for, she rearranged the section depending on what she's going to go into. If you compare that to the resume, so this is a one-page resume. Again, similar uh, contact information up top and the use of these gray boxes to break up the sections. It's very easy to read and a good use of white space, right? My eyes are looking at the correct areas. I like this section here. So this is the summary statement. Again, maybe her job didn't require her to write a cover letter. And so this is the exact summary that we showed you in the presentation earlier. And some highlights, right? This takes out a lot of information. She has her PhD. She did an internship in a nonprofit business development, right? That's important because she's now working more on a business side of something. Communication skills. Website design and management. If there, you're going to be doing that for part of your new job, highlight that that you can do that at the top of your resume. Underneath that, she put her education and she put them next to each other, newest on the left, oldest on the right, and then just her relevant experience. Her postdoc, the business development at Dimension Sciences, and her work that she does with beyond the PhD, right? and any professional workshops that she has attended that are related to what her current job is or the job that you're going to be applying to. Again, I know from experience that Britt has done much more than this, but this is just the relevant information needed, right? To go from your resume or from your CV to your resume. So that's the end of our presentation. I just want to advertise a couple of things. We're doing our beyond office hours this summer, and we'll continue that through the academic year. So if you have a resume or a CV that you want us to look at, register for a time slot. We're happy to look at it. Maybe it's a cover letter or a teaching statement or a research statement. You just want to talk about careers in general, sign up. Appointments are free, uh, so feel free to meet with us. We also have other seminars throughout um, the summer and continued throughout the year. So we do career discovery seminar series about different roles, um, mostly outside of academia, but within two. Um, these are the ones for this summer. So we have from PhD to genomics educator, from neurobiologist to research geneticist, and from PhD to assistant professor. We also have a bunch more of previous events on our website you can check out. Um, but if you want to attend any of these, you can scan the QR code or visit our website to find them. And um, if you have any questions, feel free now. You can ask or you can put them in the chat. So um, to get more information, you can always follow us on our different social medias. At the bottom um, is our website and also our email, which we check regularly. So even if you think of anything after this event, feel free to reach out or give us a follow and we'll be happy to take any questions. All right, so we do have a really great question in the chat from Natalie. 
Um, and she asks, what would be the best way to put grants on an industry focused resume? Would you do it in a separate section to highlight it, um, especially with limited experiences outside of grad school? So that's a really great question. So I guess depending where in industry that you're applying to, if you're going for a staff scientist position, you could put that, I guess, maybe in your education section, if you got maybe like a, like a center grant or a society grant. It really just depends where you're going to be applying to. If you're going to be a project manager, you might also be responsible for applying for internal grants then you might have a separate section for it there to show that you have that experience. Yeah, and I would say, um, as Rob said, it, it does a little bit depend on the role, but maybe this is something you could put in one of your bullet points, um, maybe in one of those like metrics we talked about. Um, if you wanted to have a section, maybe like awards and honors, if you had space, um, you could put it in somewhere like that. Um, it's definitely something you can totally include, especially if the role uh, would look for something like that. And then I saw that we had a question about recordings. So this is recorded. It will be sent to everyone. Um, I think in a couple of weeks, we'll actually post it on our website as well, um, but it should be sent out after this event. All righty, uh, we do have another question. Um, should only relevant positions uh, be posted in your resume for work experience. For example, if a past job that lasted five years was a large part of your experience, but not related uh, to the current position, would this still be important to include? Yeah, I think it definitely would, especially if it's a large chunk of time like that. So um, if you essentially have five years missing from your resume, they might uh, someone might be concerned as to why. Um, I think it's good to include, and I think that's where you can kind of use those transferable skills. So you still learn things during that job. You still got experience. Um, I think it would be important to include. So for example, for me, like I have some experiences and jobs I cut out. Like, for example, I worked as a vet assistant, like over the summers between undergrad, not as ap applicable to what I do now. Um, so like I took those out, but um, I think something with a large block of time, like five years, it still would be important to include. I don't know if you have any advice, Rob. Yeah, so I, I mean, you can, if it was important in your, I guess, development as a scientist or uh, MSL or whatever. So for instance, so something that I was able to highlight in my own teaching experience. So like I worked at an assisted living home for five years and I was able to recall some experiences from that where it isn't a lot of customer service, right? You, you like a good attitude to, uh, to work with, teamwork and being able to communicate while you're talking about a sensitive population in, of individuals. Um, so how you pull from that what you can, right? Um, again, if you scooped ice cream for one summer, maybe not highlight that, that doesn't seem very significant, but even if you worked in a, a job for five years while you're an undergrad, include it. And as you, uh, as you progress through your field, like you'll be able to take those things off and replace it with other experiences, right? So don't be afraid now. It's like, I don't have an industry position and I want to go into industry. Don't view it that way. Use what you have now. And as you age and progress, replace that information with newer information. Oh, can you put the QR code up again? Is another question in the chat. Uh, Julie, so I believe Brit has posted all the links in the chat. Uh, so I believe if you scroll up, our, that should be on the Beyond the PhD website. And our Eventbrite sign up is the first one that Brit posted. Um, and I'm going to send the, um, the website to everyone. I'll put it in there again. Um, everything should be available on the website. So links to the signups for all the upcoming events. Um, when we post this, it'll also go onto the website. Um, which is, and there's also lots of previous uh, seminar recordings, information from our past events. Um, we did a LinkedIn workshop last summer. So there's a lot of content there if you're looking for anything else. And I'm not seeing any more questions currently. Um, 
If you do have questions and you prefer to ask them uh, not in the chat, again, office hours is a great time to do that. You'll be paired up with one of us at Beyond the PhD, um, so you can uh, find that information on our website as well. Uh, again, everything we offer, uh, we like to keep it as free as we can possibly make it, um, so it benefits you guys. Um, again, uh, Britt also posted uh, in the chat a survey um, if you liked this event or if you want to see some improvements made to it. I'm going to copy and paste her message again, um, and she also sent in the link to office hours. So please, we welcome your feedback. We're always trying to get better for you guys, um, and thank you for coming today. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. And if you want to get involved, reach out to us. We're always looking for people to join our team. And you don't have to be at UConn to join. We have people at Boston College and University of Central Florida. So reach out, uh, get involved if you want to. But thank you for attending today. Oh, it looks like we have one last question. Um, is mentorship available? So I think that's something you could definitely discuss during our office hours. Um, it's a pretty non-structured format. Um, if you have questions, if you need guidance or help, um, it doesn't just have to be about the resume or CV. It can kind of be anything grad school related, job applying related. So um, it's definitely open if you want to reach out. Yeah, definitely reach out to us. Yeah. Um, and you said it especially for research, uh, master's of science. So I know I specifically did a research-based master's. Um, some of us did as well um, before entering a PhD. So um, something I'd be happy to talk about um, if you had more questions. On the office hour sign up, there's room to, to make notes about what you want to discuss. Um, so if you list that you're interested in being paired up with someone who's also done similar things, uh, we will do our best to match you up with someone who can do that. Do you have another question? You can unmute yourself if you would like. Oh, sorry. It sounds like we're getting some feedback, but also another way to uh, to reach us is through our email. Um, so we have that link for the um, office hours. Can you but hear our, oh, me. Yeah, I think we can hear you. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me, please? Yeah. Yep. Um. So I was the one that um quickly asked about um mentorship especially when it comes to research for uh, master's students and probably assisting them with your research also. And if it is available, is it, um, does it involve um, payment of service or how, those, how do we go about it in case it is available? Thank you. Yeah, so I think for those, it's a little bit dependent on the program. Um, I don't know if you have like specific universities in mind, um, but it's definitely something we're happy to discuss with you. Um, I don't know, Rob, you want to? Oh, okay, it's so like, like healthcare students, public, public global health area. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, you cut out in the end. I reach out, out to us via email and we'll we'll be happy to help you and point you in the right direction if we can do anything. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thanks. Okay, well, um, I don't see other questions. Thank you everyone for attending today. Um, feel free to reach out to us if anything else comes up. Thanks, everyone.